Hi, I'm Michael Clinton, and I'm about to have a productive conversation with Mike Vardy. We're going to start off this conversation with a roar. Actually, we're going to take it throughout the whole conversation. Roar into the second half of your life before it's too late is the book by Michael Clinton, and he is the guest on today's program. Uh, We talk about the importance of knowing that when you go into the second half of your life, that it's not the end of it. (laughs) We get into a lot of conversations around that. This is a conversation that happened uh, a couple of months back. We're releasing it today. Um, I'm, I went back and revisited the episode as I was preparing the show notes. And I have to say, it's, it's, it's a great conversation. It's one that should definitely be something that you pay attention to, no matter what phase of life you're in, um, because you want to make sure that you roar into the second half of your life. And Michael has plenty of stories and experiences that he shares during our conversation and in the book that'll help you do that. So without further ado, here is my productive conversation with Michael Clinton. I love talking to people who have the same name as me because it, it, it just, I already know right out of the gate that we're going to have at least one thing in common. So Michael, thanks for joining me today on the program. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much, Mike. And it's good to know that my family does not call me Mike. They call me Michael. So we now know we're differentiated. We do. I only get called Michael when I'm in trouble. There you go. <laughs> and the middle name gets thrown in there as well. Maybe that's how it's stuck for me over the years. <laughs> <laughs> well, now that we've established you're a troublemaker, uh, this book may be a troublemaking one for for some people because they may they may not be necessarily they may be ready for it, but they're they're like, oh, I don't know, I don't know. There's some some people really hesitate around the idea of roaring or even going into the second half of your life because they're so used to the way things have been. Um, when you put this book together, Roar, into the second half of your life before it's too late, was was that one of the things that you were taking into account? Like people, There are some people that are very hesitant and or dismissive of the notion that, hey, you know what, maybe, maybe I should be doing this thing that I should have always been doing or that I've really wanted to do. Yeah, well, you know, the big wake up call that I had, which led to the book is that, you know, if you're 50 and healthy today, you have a really good shot of living to be 90, even 100. And so all of this notion of, you know, when I'm in my 50s or I hit 60, you know, my life is is not a long runway is all changing. And so it's it's creating this awakening with people that they can have a second or third career, a new relationship, a new lifestyle. And that, that seems to be giving a big stimulus for people to think about, I, 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 you know, I'm not going to be able to sit there and play golf for 25 years, the proverbial golf game. And so I think it is, uh, it, there's a big awakening happening. And in the book, I interviewed 40 individuals who, in fact, made the decision to pivot and change and talk about how they do it. You know, uh, one of the things that came up as I was going through the book was this idea that uh, you promoted somebody Near, near when you were in your role at Hearst, right? When you're when you're at Hearst, because that was the role that you had before. She, she was seventy, if I remember correctly. Was was she seventy years old? Can you tell that story a little bit? I don't. I don't want you to real, reveal all the stories in the book because the book there's a lot of great stuff in here. But that one was like because that's inside of a corporate environment where people are like, first off, you should be gone. Like once you hit a certain age, not even retirement age, but there's an age where it's like, okay, this is where you are and this is where you stay. You bucked that trend, and so did this individual. Yeah, for sure. As you know, I was president and publishing director of Hearst Magazines, and I had an executive who you're alluding to who was phenomenal. You know, she regard. I never looked at her, you know, th- through her age lens. She was a contributor. She was a performer. She was innovative. She was all of those things. And so, before I stepped out of the day to day, I promoted her and gave her a larger portfolio. And I think what we're going to see happen, and there's a lot being written about this right now, is, you know, the talk of a 60-year work career that we're all going to have and how we're going to be working longer, some of us because of financial needs, some of us because of a desire to stay engaged and involved in our our main career. So I think as time goes on, those 60s and 70-year-olds who are staying in their profession, it's not going to become so unusual corporations, HR, you know, all of those folks are going to have to get on board because it's the people who are going to drive this. It's not going to be the institutions. The people are going to re- demand this, quite frankly, in terms of their own lives. Well, and that's the thing. The institutions will follow because they'll have no choice. That's the thing is unless you, unless you put the pressure on, unless there's enough people 
professing it. Um, you know, I've talked to Rich Carl Garda before about this. Uh, he wrote the book Late Bloomers, fantastic book. We'll link to that episode in the show notes. And my buddy Steve Dotto, who was, uh, he's based in Vancouver, he was on TV and he kind of, like he's embracing what he calls the gray wave and, and he's leaning harder into that as well um, as he's gone from television to YouTube to like just embracing a lot of technology. So as, it's interesting because the boomer, like my, my parents are boomers, I'm a Gen Xer, um, I can tell the difference between the people who are like just leaning into this idea of roaring in versus the, those that aren't. And I know some people that aren't, that are just like, they're bored out of their minds. And they, it's because I don't know, were they, were, were, were we sold a bill of goods that was like, you work until, you know, you're 65 and then you can do whatever you want. But by the time you're 65 or you're retired, you're like, I'm not capable of doing what I wanted because not enough money. I'm now, I'm now a bit more, you know, beat up than I was when I was younger. I, 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 is that a generational thing that, that, that is, well, I'd love to lean into that a little bit before we start to actually break down the acronym of roar. Yeah. Thanks. I guess gaslight is the word that comes up to my mind when you talk about, you know, this is, this is what you're supposed to be doing when you're 60 or 65 or 70. I'll draw an analogy almost to, I'm going back to the seventies, to the women's movement when women created lots of different role models for young women. And I think the boomers are going to create a lot of different role models, not just for their peers, but for the Gen Xers and the next generation. You know, I'm hoping that today's 35-year-old can look at a 65, 70-year-old reimagineer, is, is what I call them, and say, wow, that's an option for me. You know, I don't have to go live this quote-unquote retired script that I was handed. I can go and start a business become an entrepreneur, you know, go run a marathon at 65. I want new role models. And I think the boomers, of which I'm one, you know, we like to shake it up. We always have. And I think our new, our new platform is shaking up what second half can look like. So I think there's got a lot happening in that on that. Platform. You mentioned reimagineer, and that's going to lean right nicely into and dovetail nicely into the idea of what ROAR stands for. So can we First off, let's break it down. And then I want to get into some, as you go through the books, there's some tips and there's a couple of them that I definitely want to allude to. And I'm going to, they may not necessarily all happen in order the book because I want people to go pick up the book. Uh, but right. but uh, if we can break it down a little bit uh, so that people have a sense of, okay, so if I'm going to roar into the second half of my life, what does that mean? Yeah, well, first of all, I wanted this to be a book that that people could completely understand and relate to. So it's a combination of aspiration and very practical guidance um, for people, let's call it 35 to 55 or even 60. And, you know, it is really targeted to the professional class, uh, you know, knowledge workers, you know, people who are aspiring in their lives and striving. So the acronym is reimagine your life before someone else does it for you, because, you know, we all know what's going on with, you know, downsizing and natural disasters, et cetera. What is your favorite future? And the first R is really the tools to help you shape that. The O is own your stuff. I mean, own your numbers, own your health numbers, own your financial numbers, where you are right now, own where you come from, and own, take a really hard look at where you are right now. And where is it that you want to pivot? Where is it that you feel that you need to have a reimagination in, in your life? The A is the action plan. One of my favorite chapters is all about life layering, which is a technique that I've used now for over 25 years as a life philosophy, which is uh, a very um, meaningful chapter because, you know, we all tend to define ourselves by our professional seat. And this is a process to build other personas and identities so that you're not defining yourself by what you do, but rather who you are. And the final R is reassess your relationships, because those people around you, especially if you're, let's call it 40, and you're married or you're not married, you have kids, you may not have kids, but your, your close ends, your partner, your spouse, your kids, your family, your whatever, are the real, really the ones who are going to help you facilitate to, to move, your life, move your life forward. And that also includes your work people. And that includes your community. So the, the, the relationship piece of this is really important 
uh, mechanism to help you move forward. And they all, that's the simple definition. And they all intertwine. Like, I mean, you know, that's, yeah. that's one of the things I noticed as going through the book is the idea that the relationship things goes back to ownership, right? Like they're, they're like right. everything kind of interacts and, and intermingles. One thing that, I, so the first tip that I came that I, that I actually not only dog eared and people know that when I do this, I dog ear and I make notes and all that stuff is one of the word tips was we need to be in a constant state of reimagining, thinking through the next phase of every aspect of our lives. You could start that process at any time. If you're committed to true change, why not reimagine yourself before someone or something reimagines your life for you, which I think is great. Seth Godin's alluded to this too, in the idea of the linchpin and things like that. Like there's some elements of this that I mean, what I love about books like this is that they put everything together. It, and again, the life layering thing, we're definitely going to get into because there's some really cool stuff there, but I actually wrote down with that tip, how do you stay present in the, while still doing this reimagining? Because I think what can happen is people can get, they can go too far one way. They can get so bogged down in the present. They go, Oh, this isn't possible. Or they could get so flight of fancy and so flight they're like, oh, I'm going to be here. And then they forget about, oh, wait a minute, this right here, right now, I'm going to need to deal with this. So how, how, what's the balance there? How does someone stay present, but yet still put themselves in the state of reimagineering? Yeah, that's a great, great question. First of all, I think reimagination and reimagining needs to be a lifelong philosophy and approach. And when you integrate that into your constant way of thinking, um, you know, I ask people when they're 85, what's your favorite future? I ask people when they're 25, what's your favorite future? It is, it is a constant process. W one of the things, because everyday life gets in the way, as you, as you say, and, you know, sometimes it's hard to think about what, what will be next. I always suggest that people pick one thing to focus on. The, the big takeaway for me in all these interviews is that it took people one to two years to really do the work to identify where they wanted to reimagine and then get on the, they had to get their head there first, then they had to build the practical steps, then they almost had to build a parallel track to their present life before they could actually make the pivot it's, and make the change. It's almost like a, like they have the the main story arc of their lives, but then they have yeah. this backstory that they're, the, the subplot right? That, that yeah. takes time yeah. to, interestingly enough, Michael, just sidebar is that, um, as a comic book geek and people know this, if they've seen my stuff before the moon Knight series is coming out and people are like, why wouldn't they make it into a movie, a movie, a movie? I'm like, that character is so layered. You could, you, the movie would have to be seven hours to get all of the nuance. So similarly, like this kind of thing, when you say like it, it one to two years, from what I gathered, it was, you know, focused attention for the one to two years, but then it doesn't stop. Like, that's the other thing too, right? Right. Well, because you go through different life stages. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, when your kids are gone, that's a whole life stage right there. And, you know, if you had children when you were 25 and all of a sudden you're 45 and you're becoming an empty nester, you know, there are, you're going to have another 45 years ahead of you. So you've done all those child rearing. And then, you know, you're going to have your core relationship and let's hope that continues. But what if it doesn't? And then you might be, I mean, we all know people who find themselves widowed, divorced, et cetera, at 60. And, you know, there's a reinvention there. And, you know, it is a constant process because life, life events evolve and change us and we have to adapt. One of the analogies I love to use is how we've all had to adapt to technology. You know, you had to do it. You had no choice. You had to do it. So it's the same kind of thing, adapting to your circumstances and where, where can they take you? So as I moved into the second part of the book where we talk about ownership, like the owning piece, one of the other tips that stood out was your personal ambition and passion should be what drives you. So what have you put on a back burner that's getting a lot hotter? We hear a lot about back burner. Like I'm gonna put this on the back burner. We've um, um, there's this great uh, David Sedaris has this great essay called uh, Hey Kuka, uh, I think it's Hey Kookaburra, I believe if I remember is where it's like you know yeah. you have the different and you only have four places on the stove that you can use and everything else. It the, I, but no one talks about the back burner stuff getting hotter. It's just put that on the back burner. Um, it's as if the back burner's off, you know, <laughs> like, it's like, it's like we have a, a range upstairs and the kettle that sits on the, on the off burner and it's just there. That's where you keep it. And you turn it on when you need it. And you turn. So what are some of the signals that you, you've had yourself or through your interviews where people were like, 
oh, that back burner thing, it's getting hotter. Because I think that's one thing people fail to recognize is, oh, this thing that was on the back burner, I it's the kettle's boiled dry. I let it sit and now it's, it's so hot that I, uh, you know, uh, I have to bring it to the forefront. Yeah. I'll answer that two ways. One is my, one of my favorite stories in the book interviews with the, was with a woman who was a sales executive in for many different industries. And she was married with two kids and she'd always wanted to be a writer. And it was really what her back burner topic was. And she finally, in her 50s, uh, around 55, 56, decided she was going to really focus on this. It was part of that one to two year thing. Hmm. And she, she took courses and she took master class with Dan Brown. She wanted to be a mystery writer. She went to some conferences, you know, et cetera, et cetera. To make a long story short, she wrote a novel. She said she had 170 rejections and she um, gulped and she stayed with it. And she finally got her first novel published at 62. She's now 66. She's written five novels. She now calls herself a novelist, and she brought it back from the back burner to the front burner. And I think what one of the lessons there is go back to your younger self. What is it that you left on the shelf, on the back burner in your younger self that brought you excitement and passion and interest, but you got sidetracked because you were told that you should be practical and get an accounting degree instead of being an anthropologist and, you know, et cetera. Um, you know, the second way I'll answer that is I was one of the, I was very happy and proud to be one of the uh, folks who launched Oprah Winfrey's magazine, oh the, oh, the Oprah magazine. And the one thing that I always loved what Oprah said was, you know, you have this little voice in the back of your head and it starts getting louder and louder and louder. And you can you can try to ignore it. But that for, that voice is going to wake you up at two in the morning. Mm. That's back burner stuff where you know that you've got to really address something that's in your life. And or and or that may be one of the things that you gave up a long time ago that you need to bring back. You know, sidebar real quick. Um, if you're listening to this right now and you haven't listened to Oprah Winfrey and Brene Brown talk about Brene's latest book, Atlas of the Heart on Oprah's podcast, it's on spot. I think it's Spotify exclusive, but you you yeah. should. Uh, yeah. It was um, I've seen Oprah's conversations, Super Soul Sundays with Gretchen Rubin, who I've had the pleasure of chatting with before. And her and Brene just have this great great chemistry. It's fantastic. And Brene's book, Atlas of the Heart is uh, something I'm currently reading as we're recording this. And it's, it's, it's another way. I think that there's actually some stuff that you could tie in from Atlas of the Heart that will help you deal with some of the stuff that you're going to be having to go, go through in the process you're going through with Roar, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, Brene's a wonderful uh, and amazing inspirational um, speaker and writer. And I've had the pleasure of meeting her as well. Um, let's move on to, uh, an element of layering. We, we, I mean, she talks about the layering of emotions in the Atlas of the heart and the different, and the different roles and the unexpected things that can, that, that can be related. When I was going through the book and I got to the life layering piece, I'm like, hold up. What's this? Cause it's, it's, I love it when you've, you've, you think you've been doing something or you think you have a, a sense of it. And then as much as we don't like labels, when something gets uh, defined for you or that it crystallizes or clarifies it for you, it's like, oh, this is what this, this is a piece that's missing. Or this is, this is the permission I've been waiting for, right? Like either or. Of the, and when I saw the act now with life layering, I was, that was a thing that, that I think people who get caught up in like, I need to do as much as possible, uh, if they start to lean into life layering, they get to do that, but without all of the pressure that they feel comes with this productive posturing that comes with it. Can you, first off, I'd love to hear your take on that, but also lean in and, and dive into a little bit about what life layering is and maybe what it isn't. Cause I think th some people yeah. can go too far with it too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me start with my own personal story, which was when I was 39 years old, I was the publisher of GQ. I had been the youngest publisher in the industry. I'd been the publisher for five years. Great job. Great job. I had a great family life, but I had this epiphany that I was a very boring human being because uh, all I was doing was working and I needed to, as they say, get a life. So on a business trip coming home on a, on a flight, I decided I was going to tap into my adventure self. I, mean, I have a lot of adventure streak in me. 
and made the decision to take a flying lesson and go climb Mount Kilimanjaro to celebrate my 40th birthday. And that led to what it was my, what I'll call my first life layer in that I decided my 40s were going to be my adventure years. And so I made it a point once a year minimally to take an adventure trip with a group of you know, family or friends. And we picked a place every year and we've climbed mountains all over the world and we skied and we hiked and we've done all sorts of fun things. And that layer, which is now you know, over you know, 25 years, has become an extremely rich part of my self-definition. You know, I've, my, my most recent um, thing is I ran seven marathons on seven continents, including obviously a marathon on Antarctica, which is how I celebrated my 60th birthday. And so that layer was on top of my career and my family life. But to your point, you don't have to jam it all into one year to check a box. This should be something that you want to take on for your whole life. So in my 50s, I tapped into my creative layer. I really focused on my photography. I ended up publishing eight books of my photography. I had a publisher who was, um, just kept churning me out and you know, had photography shows, et cetera. And so my creative layer, and the thing about creativity, whatever your creative passion is, there's no time stamp on it. Mm-hmm. You know, you can be a photographer to the end of your days. You can be a writer. You can be a sculptor. You can pick, pick your creative passion. So ultimately what happens is you get this big, fat, delicious layer cake that you're building in a life. And, and one doesn't replace the other. It's always additive to. You just have to identify what's important to you. For me, it was adventure travel. It was photography. It was marathoning. It was philanthropy. And so getting back to the earlier discussion, when I stepped out of my day-to-day seat at Hearst, which was a very terrific seat as the president and publishing director, that self-definition was only one small part of my layer cake. Right. And so, you know, a lot of people, when they step out of their profession, they go off the cliff because they have not cultivated other things. And so I like to say, start now, start if you're 25, start if you're 35. Start if you're 55. It doesn't matter. Just build a layer and stick with it. Um, and, you know, that's what life layering is. It, it isn't, you know, a quick, a quick jab of like, okay, I'm going to take a photography course and then I'm not going to do it. Boom, in and out. Really think about focusing on it and, and developing it, no pun intended, over, you know, a long arc of your, of your life. Well, and I think one of the things that I noticed as I was reading the book is the enthusiasm throughout. Like there was just a... Uh, I didn't read, <laughs> let's put it this way. As I went through the book, I'm like, he's, he's how old? What is he done? Like, it just, there was this, and again, I think there's a preconceived notion about, you know, like, I mean, ageism is a thing and people are, have this sense of, oh, uh, you know, if you're, if you're at this age, that's it, you're done. And, and what, what fascinates me is someone said to me, like, what are you going to do when you're done writing? Like, cause I'm a writer first and foremost as well. Like what do you, what, I'm, I'm going to be dead probably like I'm a writer. That's what I do. And they're, and they're like, well, will you always write? I'm like, no, I, pro- I, pro- I don't know what I'm, go- I'm, but I, I've been a writer since I was, you know, in grade six and I'm going to keep doing that because I love doing, but I also make films and I also did comedy and I also, and, and I think you're, I think people, again, they, there is this, this idea of being a uh, doing productive instead of being productive. Like I talk about this is like, you know, like, yeah. and, and you mentioned about like layering life and things that are lifelong pursuits. I think what some people get caught up in too, and this leans in nicely to the, the, the tail end of, of roar is lifelong friendships. And there, there are some for sure. Um, and technology has allowed friendships that may have not stay and, or, or stood the test of time to either be rekindled or have that happen. I mean, Facebook has been wonderful for that in a lot of ways. There are other ways where it's not been so wonderful, but um, one of the things that I appreciated as you went, as I went through the book was because roar is it, it, you got starts with an R and ends with an R you put relationships at the end. I think that that was very clever and, and I don't know if it was by design or by default because I think you can't reimagine before you figure relationships out, because sometimes the relationships can hold you back. That's been one of the things that I've struggled with too, is, I mean, the, my, the best man at my wedding, we don't talk anymore. 
which is, and the only time I see him is the photo on the wall. And there, there used to be longer lingering moments of, oh, I mean, but those moments have gotten fewer and further between because we're different people now. So can you touch on the relationship piece? First, first off, I, I'm imagining it was by design and not by default, the way the ears are set up. And then how do you, how, how important is it for people not only, not only to embrace relationships and try to cultivate them, but to be okay with letting go of ones that, that are frankly at, they've reached their end. Well, you, you hit a great nerve and yes, it was by design because ultimately all of the things we talk about in the book can't happen unless those around you are the, the, the wind beneath your wings, as they say. You know, the, the thing about my business in the magazine business is we have a very important word called editing. And you know that as a writer. And you have to edit your life as well with the people who have become toxic, the people who are no, no longer supportive of you for whatever reason. There might be jealousy involved. There might be you grew separate parts. I mean, I, too, have many, you know, really long lasting relationships that I had to end both, by the way, family, too. Mm -hmm. You know, it is, it's just not friends. And I think surrounding yourself by the people who are going to facilitate you and support you and be, be honest with you and who you can be vulnerable with is incredibly important in this, in this journey. And that, that happens throughout our lives. I also like to say simultaneously, listen, I was on CBS Morning News. I was interviewed by Gail King and I got, Gail asked me the pointed question. So Michael, how old are you? And I said, Gail, I'm 68, and 68 is the new 68. Let's stop saying that 60 <laughs> is the new 40. And she, she laughed, and she said, I'm 66. And so it's the same thing, and we're, we're the role models, I hope. But the, the key is that when you're in your 60s or your 50s, you should have friends who are in their 20s and in their 30s and friends in their 80s and in their 90s because it brings you perspective and it brings you thought. And I want to know what 20 somethings think. I mean, I don't, and I want to do it. I want to do it on, on their head. I don't, in their head, I don't want to do it in my head. And so reverse mentoring is important. You know, I have a few 20 somethings who are my, my mentors. Um, and so I think this notion, and you can develop new relationships at any point in your life. You just have to be open to it and, you know, hopefully find the people. My best friend in the world right now is somebody who I met in my early 50s. And, you know, this, this is a fellow marathoner and a best, we're best friends and we travel together. He's part of the adventure group and we are um, brothers from another mother. And so I'm really lucky to have met, um, you know, this friend in my 50s. So stay open to the possibilities. And, and it's funny, I, I think I remember reading a story about Charlie Munger hanging out with somebody like he was at a beach or something like that. He was working on his computer. He had somebody that was like in their twenties and he, he, the, he's like that I've made friends with this person because they know more about this than me. And we've, they're learning from me. I'm learning from them. I think that, that it's such a, I think it's such an amazing um, world that we live in now where because of the pursuits that we're all capable of in, in, in that most people can, but let, let, I don't want to be too general, yeah. but that, yeah. that the capabilities that are there allow and the opportunities allow for this kind of thing to happen. One of the things that I, as we get close to wrapping up here in this book, I think the, the wisdom that's in here is can, can be appreciated again and again, because it's, it's a, it's, there is a, an awareness and a perspective shift that happened as I went through. I mean, you, I mean, you're looking at this right now. You could see the dog ears that, that, you know, um, there are a lot of uh, amazing points in here. And I think that as we wrap up, if, if someone was to look at the book and walk away from this episode, you know, they pick up the book, but they want to get started now. They're like, I want to get going now, Michael, what can I do to get, what's the first step I can take to start to roar into this second half, third, fourth half of whatever half or quarter or fraction of the life that they're in? Yeah, well, you know, you can't do it all at once, even though I did interview a woman who decided to have a complete year of change in every aspect of her life. And wow. And she told her story, but I say, pick the one thing. Pick one thing, start there. If it's, you know, to get healthy and fit and, and you know, and, and live that kind of healthy life, then 
decide what that's going to be and how you're going to get there. There's a great story of a woman who lost 100 pounds, um, and she tells her story in, in the book. You know, if it is to change your career, if it is to get out of a bad relationship or marriage, if it is to get out of a city or town, pick the one thing that has been gnawing at you and really spend the time to take a deep dive into it to dissect why is it and what is it that you want to do to fix that. And the book gives you lots of tales and lots of tools to be able to go in the process. But you have to start first by identifying what it is that you want to change or you want to reimagine. The book is called Roar into the Second Half of Your Life Before It's Too Late. Michael Clinton, thanks for joining me on the program today. Where can people keep up with you and the, the stuff that you are doing nowadays? Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, first of all, the books, you know, uh, print, audible, I read the book, um, Kindle, RoarByMichaelClinton.com. We are launching a monthly newsletter, which will then lead into some coursework and some uh, set Zoom sessions and live sessions, ultimately, around the topic. Listen, this is a topic that is, you know, by 2030, one in five Americans is going to be 65 or older. And there is this huge bulge of people who are going to rewrite the script as to what it means to, I like to say, live longer, not get older. Mm -hmm. And so this is a topic that's not just going to be with the boomers, but has huge impact for people in their 40s and 30s and even 20s. Because those 20-somethings, they're going to be in a minority in terms of the age population when, you know, over the next 20 years, they're going to be with declining birth rates and an aging population, you know, these 20 some it's going to have a lot of impact on their life in lots of different ways. So they need to be a part of the conversation to find the right solutions and balance for all of us and ultimately for them when they're in their 70s and 80s. So uh, we're going to talk a lot about that in the in the uh, the war platform. Mike, thanks for that. Michael, see, see, you're not in trouble with me. <laughs> Notice I didn't call you Mike. I know, I know, I know. Uh, thanks for having a productive conversation with me today. Thanks, Mike. I loved it. Thank you. Thanks to Michael for joining me on the program today. And again, Michael has so much experience and it shows, not just throughout the conversation, but throughout the book. And you want to pick up the book. Don't forget to check out all the links worth exploring. And you can do that at productivityist.com slash podcast 423. Pick up the book as well. Okay, so don't forget to do that. Again, that's productivityist.com slash podcast 423. Visit there right now. But subscribe to the podcast first if you're not already a subscriber. So hit the subscribe button in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Overcast, wherever you're listening to this. That way you don't miss a single episode of what's to come. And next time around, I'm joined by Neil Williams. Uh, that's another conversation that's been months in the making, and I'm looking forward to bringing it to you. I'm also looking forward to having you check out some of our sponsors, the ones you listen to today in particular during our conversation. You want to make that happen, go to productivityist.com slash podcast sponsors, and you can do that now as well. And there's lots of great sponsors that have supported the show during this episode. So don't miss out on that. Again, productivityist.com slash podcast sponsors. You can also click on the link in the show notes as well. That's it for this episode of A Productive Conversation. Until next time, I'm Mike Vardy reminding you to stop doing productive and start being productive. See you later.